And now we're going to move on to puff pastry. And the best puff pastry I've ever tasted and the easiest to make is that made by my friend John Tovey. So I've invited him to come along and show us how to do it. Welcome to the cookery course, John. Hello, Delia. So where do we start? Well, first of all, we have the same kind of flour that, as you've been using for the shoe pastry. And into this bowl, we've got one pound of sieved strong flour with a little pinch of salt. And you'll see we've spread round eight ounces of lard and eight ounces of margarine. And it must be at this texture, most important, nice and soft and put it all in in small pieces. That's what I call kitchen temperature. Kitchen temperature. Yes. Good. And then simply get your hands and just gently coat it all. Gently see that most pieces, you haven't got to be too particular about this pastry. This is why I like making it. And then you make a well in the middle. Is and that all you do? That's all you do. You've just got the flour and the little pieces of margarine and lard coated. Now into that well, you put a tablespoon of lemon juice made up to half a pint of extremely cold water. All goes in at once. All goes in at once. And then with a palette knife, just mix it all together until it starts to form a basic dough. It looks quite messy at this stage, but, you know, don't bother. Don't get worried at all. No, this is the stage where most people take fright, isn't it? Because yep. it just looks as though it's never going to be anything at all. It looks a real mess, if I don't say <laughs> anything else. Put it to one side. Now, we've had a pound there. We've had a pound of fat to a pound of flour. Equal quantities. Equal quantities. And most recipes say 12 ounces of fat to a pound. So what I'm going to do, I can be pretty generous now with the flour that I'm going to put on the board. I see. And so you've got nothing to worry about. Just take your bowl, plonk the ingredients out, make certain you've got them all out, and then purely and simply make a brick. You've left a bit, shall I? Give it to oh you? yes, thank yeah, you very are. much. Smashing. Smashing. Just make it into the shape and size of a normal house brick. Now, this is the important thing. It's the rolling that I think is so important. And this is where people go wrong. I can't believe you're going to be able to roll that. Well, I'm going to be able to, I can <laughs> assure you. I'm going to put plenty of flour on. And you get your rolling pin, Delia. And you must always hold your pin at either end quite lightly. Never use any pressure. You can't do this if you had a row with your husband in the morning. You've got to be nice and light <laughs> about it. And all you simply do is pat it in the middle, pat it in the top, and at the bottom, and then you roll away from you all the time. You never bring the rolling pin back on the dough. You just roll away and back, roll away and back, roll away and back. It'll go of its own accord. It's a bit hot and a bit sticky. It doesn't matter. We can put plenty of flour on. That's because you've got that big quantity of fat. Big quantity you can be of generous fat. With roll the away, roll away. Can you see how light it is? It's going of its own accord. We're spreading it out, spreading it out. And then what you must do is you must make certain that you straighten the edges and you straighten the bottom mm, and you straighten the top. Yes, but the thing is, you do that uh, so as you've got it in the rectangle and then you divide it into three. You take the bottom third up and fold it over. Don't worry about it breaking. Not at all. You're trapping the air inside mm -hmm. and then we bring this one down and bring that over. Now then, we've got the air trapped in here, haven't we? We've put the first rolling that way and the second one here. We want to keep the air in, so I tap the three sides like that, and this is important. This is where people often get confused with the recipes that they read. You have to give it a quarter turn. Pretend that is six o'clock. You turn it round to nine o'clock, and you should really give it a five minute pause at this stage but as we want to do it quite quickly we can go straight on mm -hmm. put plenty of flour on your rolling pin and you tap it in the middle you tap it on the bottom tap it in the and just roll it away from you bringing your rolling pin back every time you can see now it's beginning to look slightly better than what the yeah. awful conglomeration it was you're before not, you're not hardly doing anything. no it's easy. you can see i'm using absolutely no yes. pressure at all and you've cut out all that tiresome resting you know when you have to leave something for a half an oh. hour it's so inconvenient i always forget what i'm doing i either forget about it and go out without leaving something <laughs> in the oven cut it into three again over now at this stage if you think you've got too much flour on i use a perfectly ordinary distemper brush Gosh. and just remove any surplus flour I have to get myself one of those. A distemper well, brush. Distemper brush. Bring that one over the gain. Tap the sides, three sides, and once again give it its quarter turn. Now I'm going to put plenty more flour on the board there. And this is the third turn. And it really is now, I can feel it's beginning. I'm going to make certain that I've got plenty of flour underneath. It's beginning to feel really light and doughy. I'm going to tap it in the middle. 
There we are. Tap it in the top, tap it in the bottom. This is the third turn, and it's beginning to feel a little like bread dough. It, it, you know, it won't go any, you can't stretch it, it's so easy, and it's the rolling. You'll see, I'm rolling, rolling. That's a, that's a miracle. <laughs> yes, this is the third roll. It's beginning to look like the stuff you buy at, you know, one of the national stores. <laughs> Get the sides absolutely level. Get the bottom level and the top. This is the third time. And don't forget, you normally rest five minutes. If when you do that, it's not going to meet, you can just slightly stretch it. Get your paintbrush, take off any surplus. Bring that over and take off any surplus. It's a real clarty mess we're making. You know, you, you can't do this if you're not kind of... Now, uh, for people who don't live in the north, what does clarty mean? Sticky, tacky and untidy mucky, I suppose. <laughs> this is the fourth turn. And once again, I'm going to give it its fourth and final turning and tap it in the middle, top and bottom. If you've got a freezer, you can do two separate one pound mixings. Mm -hmm. And of course, the slight pause you've got between doing the two, yes. you can just go straight on. Yes. It freezes well. And it's this folding and the air trapped inside and the fat being spread with the flour that gives the, the layers. Exactly. This is the final rolling. Now then, there we are, a third over. Absolutely. I can feel it slightly. I'm quite pleased with this one. Bring it back here. And there you are. Trap the final air in. And then you must leave it in the fridge, preferably overnight. Or, as I say, you can chill it. And you give it that final turn. And when you come to do it, we've got one, I think, yes, we've got uh, one down there. Yeah. When you come to roll it, what is important, you will see that that is the position I'd finally turned it into, because yes. that was the side I brought down from the top. Yes. I'll cut it through the middle. And this, of course, has been left overnight. This has been left overnight in the fridge. Yes. Do you have to chill it overnight? I mean, what would happen if you, if you just used that straight oh, away? Oh, no, you've got to let it. You've got, you've to, got chill to chill it, it for about four hours. Mm -hmm. And there you can see are all the various layers. Yes, I can see the all layers. All the way in it. That's what they call the thousand leaves. Yes. And then you roll it out in the normal way mm -hmm. to about an eighth of an inch thick and use it in any way. Cut out your volivant cases or you can make cornets. Yes, trees. but your volivant cases are very special because they're not the fiddly ones, are they? No. What you do is you cut out, is it three and a half inch round? About four inch, Delia. Four, four inch, inch rounds. Round and then bake them. But the off cuts that you've got left, mm -hmm. you mustn't use them to make volivons. Just use them, put them to one side, make cheese straws or do a pie topping. Mm -hmm. And we've got some that we did in fact bake. And you'll yes. see how these layers have in fact come up. Yes, here they are. So this started off an eighth of an inch thick. Yes. And now it's come up to, well, well over an inch thick. And uh, this is what you, in the hotel, you split in half. It's just split in half. And put various fillings in. Yes. If you're going to serve them hot with a hot filling, make certain that you don't put your filling in until you're actually going to get them to the table. So you have those hot, or you can re even reheat them, and then split them in two. Mm -hmm. Take out any pastry that you think isn't quite cooked as you would like it. Put your filling in and take it to the table. And then you've got uh, John Bolivans. Toby's Bolivans. Well, yes. thanks very much for explaining that to us, John, and coming Fine. along. I can't believe it's that easy, except that I have tasted it and I know. Well, one thing that's very easy to make at home are homemade biscuits. And a lot of people don't realise that not only do they taste so much better than the shop-bought ones, but they're also less expensive. And the first recipe I want to show you is good old ginger nuts. I've got here a nice large mixing bowl, and in it I've got four ounces of self-raising flour which I've been sifting but I'm going to add to the self-raising flour a teaspoonful of ginger. And whether that's a level teaspoon or a heaped teaspoon um, depends on how gingery you like them. And then also I've got a teaspoonful, a level teaspoonful of bicarbonate of soda. And that's going to be sifted through as well in with the flour. 
And then here I've got one and a half ounces of granulated sugar. And I'm just going to mix that lot together and then rub in two ounces of margarine. And that's rubbed in in exactly the same way as you would if you were making pastry. That's using the tips of your fingers and lifting the mixture up to get the air in as you rub it in. And you can see how very quick and easy it is. There's only just one more ingredient to go in. As soon as you get the mixture nice and crumbly, and there's no obviously large pieces of fat, um, when it's nice and crumbly like that, then the next thing we're going to do, I'm just going to wipe my hands a little bit, is add some sticky, and the sticky I've got here is two ounces of golden syrup. And that's going to provide the moisture to bind the mixture together. Very sticky, as you can see. What I'm going to do now is just start off with my wooden spoon and mix that as much as I can with the wooden spoon. And then afterwards, the only thing to do is to dive in with your hands and just bring the mixture together. And at first, you might think it looks as though it isn't going to come together, but it is. And I want to warn you at this stage to just persevere, just, just keep on pulling the mixture together gently with your hands. Um, don't add any more treacle or golden syrup because if you add too much, the mixture, the biscuits will spread out very, very thinly. And they'll be far too thin and overcook. There we are, you see it does come together eventually if you have a little bit of patience. Then you just clean your hands off Got a nice damp cloth waiting for me underneath here. And then you divide the mixture up now. It's very easy, there's no rolling out or cutting out. You just divide the mixture up into four. Like that, you can do that in the bowl. And then you divide each quarter into another four in the bowl, like that. And then you take little sections, each little section, and you roll it, just like that, between the two palms of your hands. You pop that onto a well-greased baking sheet, and you'll probably need more than one because uh, this makes quite a few biscuits. And a word about baking sheets, try and get nice solid ones if you can. There are a lot of tinny ones about which buckle and are not very good at all, so nice solid baking sheet. We'll just put one more on, because another thing I want to show you is that you shouldn't crowd them too closely together. Leave a nice gap so that they have plenty of room to spread. And then when you've arranged them on the baking sheet, just press them just very slightly like that to make round shapes, and then they'll spread out into biscuits whilst they're cooking. Now these go into a preheated oven gas mark five, that's 375 degrees, and in fact they only take 15 minutes to cook. But we've got some in the oven that have just about had 15 minutes, so I'll get them out now for you to have a look at. There we are. Now you can see the characteristic cracks on the top of the biscuits. But if you haven't made biscuits before, one thing I'd like to point out to you, and that is that when they come out of the oven, they're very, very soft. I expect you can see how soft that is. Don't be alarmed. The colour is right. They are cooked but they just need to crisp up as they cool down. So you leave them on the baking sheet for about 10 minutes and then transfer them to a wire cooling rack. And then when they're cool, I've got a cooled biscuit here to show you. They're lovely and crisp and really crunchy and well, much better than anything you could ever buy in the shops. Well, that's very easy ginger nuts. Now I'm going to show you something that's even easier, if you can believe that. And these are called um, oat crunches. 
But because sometimes I get queries from people saying, you know, what's the difference between all the different oats and oatmeals, I thought it would be a good opportunity to just go through some of them. So I've got a selection here. This is the oats when they come out of the grain, whole oats, um, unrolled, and this is called pinhead oatmeal, or just coarse oatmeal. That's used sometimes in traditional porridge, soaked overnight. It's very delicious. Next door, we've got medium oatmeal, and this has been um, ground a little bit finer than the other. Now, next door, we've got fine oatmeal, and this is really like whole wheat flour. It's very, very uh, finely ground, and you can use this in baking, bread making, pastry making, and scones too, and also um, it's good for thickening things. Now we come to the rolled oats or oat flakes and these are what are called whole oats. These are available in whole food shops and they're rolled but they still have some of the husk left on and they're much sort of chewier than the other sort. Very nice for biscuits I find. And they're called whole oats or jumbo oats. Next door here we've got porridge oats and this is the sort that you buy in a packet in the supermarket if you're going to make quick porridge that cooks in about five minutes. So there's the difference between the oatmeals. And for oat crunchy biscuits, I've got here in this bowl two and a half ounces of porridge oats and two ounces of jumbo oats, and they're going in the bowl together. And then here I've got three ounces of demerara sugar, and the demerara sugar is what makes the biscuits nice and crunchy. Now all you do is just mix those two types of oats together. Don't worry if you can't get jumbo oats. You can make these biscuits using all porridge oats, so don't worry too much about that, but it's nice to have the two textures if you can. And then just one more ingredient, and that's four ounces of melted margarine, which um, you melt in a saucepan, uh, being careful not to let it burn, just melt. And then you just mix all that up together. This is so easy that uh, I think almost anybody could make these, even if they've never cooked in their lives before. Now, I did tell you these were even easier than the last lot because there isn't even any rolling up to do. All you do is have ready a 7 by 11 inch tin, well greased, and uh, that's about one inch deep, and you just Long call the oatmeal mixture straight into the tin like that. What could be easier? Then, using your hands, just spread it all out as evenly as possible, getting up well into the corners. Spend a bit, little bit more time when you're doing it than I am so that you get it a little bit more even than that. And then, the nice thing about these is they can be cooked in exactly the same um, temperature as the ginger biscuits, so if you want to do a bit of batch baking, you can make a whole lot of biscuits all in one go. 375 Gas Mark 5. And I'm going to get some out of the oven now and show you what they look like when they come out of the oven. There we are. They're sort of... They've turned a nice golden brown colour, but the mixture will still be a little bit soft and that's quite normal just like with the ginger biscuits and what you then do is you take a knife whilst they're still warm and cut down the center like that and then across like that and then what you want is 12 bars and then leave them in the tin to cool completely and when they've cooled they'll go nice and crisp and crunchy.
Now we're going to move on and make some crumpets. I think crumpets are fun to make, especially in the middle of winter when it's very cold and nobody can go out. It's nice to sort of have crumpets, hot crumpets for tea. Well, we've got here in the mixing bowl um, half a pound of bread flour, that strong plain flour, the sort you use when you make bread, and that's been sifted and a teaspoon of salt added. And I'm just going to make a well in the mixture of that now and add a yeast liquid. And the yeast liquid I've got is two fluid ounces of water with a tablespoon, a level tablespoon of yeast and then a teaspoonful of sugar and half a pint of warmed milk. And that's mixed in the same way as we mixed the dough when we made bread. You wait for the yeast to get a good frothy head on it, uh, which takes about 10 minutes. And when it's got that nice frothy head, then it's ready to mix. And then you use a whisk and whisk that liquid straight into the flour. And you probably think it looks very, very wet, but that's because this isn't, in fact, a dough. This is a batter, a yeast batter. And that's what you use to make crumpets. So beat it until it's nice and glossy and smooth and all the lumps have gone. And then you put it aside with a damp cloth over it and at room temperature, warm room, kitchen temperature, it'll take about 40 minutes to 60 minutes to come up all frothy and bubbling like this one we've got here. And you'll see the texture there. It's very sort of bubbly and frothy. You can see it leaving the side of the bowl there. And uh, that's right for your crumpet making. Then you move over to the stove and you have a really thick, heavy frying pan. Uh, they used to use an old fashioned girdle, but they're rather expensive and you can do it with a good heavy frying pan or two or three if you want to make a lot of crumpets in one go. And once upon a time, there was something called crumpet rings. But now people don't make crumpets anymore. Well, perhaps they will now, we hope. Uh, you have to use these, and these are egg poaching rings. And they're very, very thoroughly greased. That's very important. I use lard to do that. And it's very important that they are well greased because otherwise the crumpets stick. You could probably get six in a large pan like this, or as I said before, you can use two or three pans. And then all that happens is you take this lovely frothy mixture here and you spoon a tablespoon at a time into the centre of each ring. If you've got some still left on the spoon, then just add a little bit more. And you can see the gluten has developed and this has become very stretchy, this mi mixture. But what you want is approximately a tablespoonful in each crumpet ring or egg poaching ring. Maybe if we all get to like making our crumpets, we might be able to get proper crumpet rings again. Perhaps some enterprising kitchen firm will make some. There we are, that's our last tablespoonful going in now. Now what's going to happen now is they need to be left to cook through. Um, the heat needs to be turned to medium and leave them for about five or six minutes and then have another look. And because we've got to wait five or six minutes before we can have another look, what I'm now going to do is show you another recipe while we're waiting. And I get a lot of letters from people saying they can't make scones. So I thought perhaps it would be nice to do some scones because once you know how, they're very, very easy. Let's have a look at some scones first. These here are just plain scones with flowery tops. And they're very nice served with homemade jam and whipped cream. Or if you live in the West Country, it's jolly nice to have clotted cream, I think, on scones. Beautiful. But I thought it would be nice to show you a different sort of scone. And I'm going to show you our cheese-crusted whole wheat scones. And to save a little bit of time, I started off here with three ounces of whole wheat flour, three ounces of self-raising flour, and a teaspoon of baking powder. And I've rubbed in one ounce of butter to the crumbly stage. Just one ounce of butter or margarine, whichever you want. And now I'm going to add a few more things. A couple of pinches of cayenne pepper, which give it a nice sort of zestiness to it. And another nice flavoring here is half a teaspoonful of mustard powder. 
which adds another little bit of zest. And then here I've got three ounces of strong grated cheddar cheese. I say strong because it's good for the flavour of scones if it's nice and strong. And I'm just going to put two thirds of that cheese in the mixture and use the rest later. So mix the cheese in with the rest of the mixture and then the liquid I'm going to add is a large egg and that's beaten up with two tablespoons of milk and so I'll start off by adding that to the dry ingredients and just tell you to have some extra milk handy because you never know when you're cooking with flour just how much liquid you're going to need and if that isn't enough you might need a little bit more liquid which indeed I think we're going to. So we'll just dive into the milk here and have, I think, almost a tablespoonful and see how we get on with that. You can do as much as you can with a wooden spoon and then just finish off as usual with your hands. What you want to aim for is a nice soft dough that leaves the bowl clean and still still it's a bit dry as I said before you can never really tell so we'll just have a spot more milk in there again just to take care of all those little dry bits in the bottom and even a spot more I think I'm going to be very particular because I've got to show you how to roll them out so they've got to be right there we are that's just about what we want now, transfer the dough onto a lightly floured surface. Just shape it, start off by shaping it into a round. And uh, I'll just tidy up my hands there. And this is where most people go wrong when they make scones. It's that they roll them out far too thinly and then they don't come up very high and people think they can't make scones. So the secret is, I'll just give my rolling pin a little bit of a flower now. The secret is, is to roll the dough out to not less than three quarters of an inch thick. And if you're new to scone making, then why not just have a ruler there and make sure you've got not less than three quarters of an inch thick when you're rolling them out. Now when you're cutting them out you need a two and a quarter inch cutter and this will give you about six or seven scones with this mixture. If you want to make more you can just double the ingredients and to cut them out you place the cutter lightly on the dough like that and then just give it a very sharp tap. Sorry about the noise but that's the way to do it especially with a thick dough like this and then just ease the shape out of the cutter and go on like that, re-rolling all the scraps until you've got six or eight. And uh, one important point about cutting anything out, scones, biscuits, is never do that with the cutter because otherwise they come out oval and not round. The next thing you do is you brush the top of the scone with a little bit of milk. If you're making plain scones, at this stage it's nice to um, sprinkle them with flour so that they come out sort of floury and look homemade but for these we're going to finish off the cheese by sprinkling some cheese on the top each scone will have a sprinkling of cheese on the top and then another little sprinkling of cayenne pepper if you like sort of zesty things now what scones need all scones cheese or otherwise is a really hot oven place them first of all on a well greased baking sheet put them on the highest shelf of an oven preheated to gas mark 7, that's 425 degrees, and they'll take about 15 or 20 minutes to cook through. And we'll just have a look at some cooked scones now. There we are, and you'll see that they've got a nice sort of crunchy cheese topping, and I think they're best eaten nice and warm from the oven, spread with lots of butter. Either way, don't ever keep scones too long because they need to be eaten as fresh as possible. Well, that's all about scones. Let's just go back now and see how our crumpets are doing. And what happens during the cooking time is the bubbles rise up and burst and make the traditional crumpet holes. And what you've got to do now is just 
slide a pallet knife round the edge and turn the crumpet over just to get it toasted on the other side using something like a wadge of kitchen paper there to protect your hands so that you don't get burnt. And whilst I don't approve of children making these because there's quite a lot of heat involved, it's quite nice to have children around when you're doing them and, and let them watch the bubbles rising up to the surface and then bursting on the top. There we are. And of course, if you've got two or three frying pans, you can make several crumpets in one go. I'm just increasing the heat there because we need to get them toasted on the other side. And you can serve them warm as soon as they're cooked. Or if you want to make them in advance, if you've got someone coming to tea and you want to make the crumpets in advance, then if they're cold, you can just toast them lightly under the grill before serving. But these are just beginning to get toasted now um, in the frying pan. And in fact, they need a little bit more. But anyway, whether you toast them in the frying pan or let them get cold, or toast them under the grill, what's really nice is to have them served hot so that the butter can melt all through the holes. And I like them with honey or with homemade jam. Sometimes people are very good at making sponge cakes and other times there are people who never can. Now if you're one of those people who can't make a sponge cake, I've got really good news for you because this beautiful light moist feathery sponge in front of me here doesn't actually need any skill. All you do is you just throw the ingredients into a bowl, whip them up and bake them and you have a perfect sponge cake. <laughs> So we're going to make an all-in-one sponge now, just to show you how easy it is. First of all, nice big roomy bowl, because you want to get air in. And then four ounces of self-raising flour sifted into the bowl, holding the sieve up nice and high, again, so that you can get plenty of air into the flour as it goes down into the bowl. This flour has also got a teaspoonful of baking powder in with it. And although it's self-raising flour, for an all-in-one sponge, you need to have baking powder as well. You need a bit of extra raising powder. Power. Now I've got four ounces of soft margarine, and this is what makes it possible to do it all in one. This soft tub type of margarine. Then I've got four ounces of caster sugar, and for sponges, and for most cakes, you need a fine texture, so do always use caster sugar. Then two eggs, plonk, in they go. See how easy it is. And now a little bit of vanilla essence. You can, of course, use other flavourings, like orange peel, lemon peel, coffee essence, cocoa. But I'm just going to use a little bit of vanilla essence in this particular sponge. Then, again, because I don't believe in working too hard, I'm going to whip it with an electric hand whisk. But if you haven't got one, you can do it with a wooden spoon. It doesn't make any difference. So you just whisk all those ingredients together. And really, quicker to make this sponge cake than to actually go down to the shops and buy one. If you're new to making sponges, you'll probably find that recipes often say mix to a dropping consistency. So I'd just like to show you what a dropping consistency is. It's when you pick the mixture up and you just tap it on the side of the bowl and it should drop off fairly easily. I thought that was a little bit heavy, so I'm going to just add a little bit more liquid, and that is going to be warm water, dessert spoonful. Now, some people use milk. I find warm water gives a lighter texture. Now, let's just mix that in. And hey, presto, we should now have a good dropping consistency. Yes, much better. So that mixture's now ready to go into the sponge tins and that's divided between two sponge tins and now I'd just like to give you one or two tips about the tins. Um, first of all, 
you can see that these are non-stick tins, and I think that's a very good thing, but sometimes they do stick. So what I'm going to do is just take a piece of margarine on some kitchen paper and just lightly grease the tins so that I've taken that extra precaution. And sponges sometimes stick to the base, so I'm going to line the bases with this, which is silicone paper. Now, it'll take you an extra minute to cut out two pieces of silicone paper, which, by the way, is better than greaseproof paper, a bit more expensive, but very reliable. And it's just worth that extra trouble. And then I'm just going to grease that again, because then you'll never have any problems with your sponges sticking. Now, they're ready to go in the oven, or they will be when they're filled, and that's gas mark 3, 325 degrees Fahrenheit. I want to give you one very important tip that's uh, right for the whole of cake making, and that is why you shouldn't open the oven door whilst a cake is cooking. I'm going to explain that now. It's the air bubbles trapped in the mixture which determine the final shape and texture of your cake. As the heat of the oven penetrates, the air will expand and the cake rises. The important point is that the cake develops its rigid structure starting round the edge where the heat penetrates first, then slowly working towards the middle. Now, if the oven door is open too early, the cold air suddenly lowers the temperature. The air in the cake will stop expanding and actually contracts, particularly in the middle where it isn't yet firm. So the number one rule is don't be too inquisitive. Go away, be strong, don't look in the oven until three quarters of the way through the cooking time. Now we've got two sponges here, which I'm going to get out of the oven to have a look at. And the nice thing now, of course, is that you get that beautiful sort of home-baked smell. Well, first of all, I'd like to show you how to tell if a cake is cooked or not. Um, it will have shrunk very slightly away from the sides of the tin, and in the centre, you just make a depression with your finger, and if it sort of bounces back at you and is nice and spongy, you know that it's cooked. And that's the way to tell whether a cake is cooked or not. The other thing I'd like to mention is the depth of the sponge tin. It's very important to have a sponge tin that's at least one and a half inches deep. If you have a half an inch deep tin, you'll have a half an inch deep sponge, and I think that's the reason why lots of people say their sponges turn out like pancakes. They just haven't got the right tin. Now we're going to turn this out and um, turn them out about 30 seconds or so after you get them out of the oven and just take off the base paper straight away and you'll find little bits of crust will come away but it comes off very easy. That's what happens when you use silicone paper. It really is very, very easy and trouble free. And there's your nice, light, beautiful sponge just flung in the bowl all together and um, what could be easier. Well, now I want to show you a recipe for a Dundee cake. This one is actually made by the classic creaming method, but first of all, I'd like to explain what a real Dundee cake should taste like. It's not a rich, heavy fruit cake that um, is moist in texture, but rather light and crumbly. What happens is, it's five ounces of butter and five ounces of caster sugar, and you beat it. You beat it until you get a very soft consistency and what happens is the butter which starts off yellowy colour, you know, the colour of butter, and then it goes very pale and that's sort of almost white and that's what a creamed butter and sugar mixture should look like. And then you start to add egg and in this case we've got three beaten eggs here and what I'm going to do is add a teaspoonful of egg, beaten egg at a time. This is the point in cake making using the creaming method where curdling can happen. So for beginners it's best to use just a teaspoon at a time with the whisk still going or the wooden spoon and just add it little by little. Now the reason it shouldn't curdle is that curdling really means breaking and if the mixture breaks 
and you lose the air that's been incorporated during the creaming. But I don't want you to worry too much about it because if you find you're doing this and it does curdle, you know, phones ring, things happen, don't worry, the cake won't be quite as light, but it'll still taste very, very good. If you can manage to avoid curdling, do. And if you can't, then don't worry. Now, that will take too long to incorporate, so I'm going to switch bowls now and show you a mixture that has had all the egg beaten into it. And that's come up quite a lot now and is quite soft. Now, the next thing you do is fold in the flour. And I've got here eight ounces of plain flour, plain flour this time, and one teaspoon, again, of baking powder in my sieve. I'm just going to fold in the flour um, a little bit at a time. And you need a metal spoon for folding because you can manoeuvre it so much better than you can a wooden spoon and you can make the cutting movement so much better. So that's what you do. You just make cutting movements like that and then just fold. And when you start off, you'll think, my goodness, I'll never fold all that flour in. It'll never go in. There won't be enough moisture, but in fact, there will be enough moisture. And if it's a bit dry at the end, then you add um, some milk. Now, we haven't got time to fold all that in, so again, I'm going to do my quick change. And I've got one here, believe it or not, that's had all the flour folded in. So we can proceed to the next stage, which is adding all the goodies. Well, first of all, I've got six ounces of currants and six ounces of sultanas. And the same thing, the same principle applies. You just use the cutting movements and lightly fold. You know, be gentle. If you want to be aggressive, you can make a loaf of bread. But if you want to make a cake, then be nice and gentle with it. And it's quite easy to be gentle. There we are. It's going to have the grated zest of an orange and a lemon. It gives a lovely tangy flavour. Two ounces of chopped mixed peel. And if you can get whole mixed peel and chop it yourself, you do get a better flavour. These are cherries. Two ounces, rinsed under the tap and dried to get all the sugary coating off. And then something else which gives a nice flavour, and that's ground almonds. And then you just carry on folding away until that's all very, very carefully folded in. And when it is carefully folded in, you then transfer it to an 8-inch cake tin. But for a cake like that that needs long cooking time, um, what you need to do is line it, line the sides as well as the base. And I've got a line tin here, but I'll take the lining out so that you can see. I'm using silicone paper again. You get a strip the length of the tin and then you just make a pleat in the strip and then cut little incisions all the way across so that when you turn it round like that, you've got those little pieces that will fit inside the tin. And it's double, just to give extra protection for the long cooking time. And the base papers are double as well. And they go in on top, which means that it all fits very well. Then using a tablespoon, you spoon the mixture into the tin and level it off like this cake mix which I made earlier and it's going to have some nice toasted crunchy almonds on the top so you take these almonds and just put them I'll lift that up so you can see put them in circles around the cake and don't press them down too hard because if you do uh, they'll disappear and never be seen again so just lightly put them in circles and this is cooked at 325 degrees, gas mark 3, and it'll take about two to two and a half hours. So that's how to make a traditional Dundee cake. We've been quite
quite serious so far. Now we're going to have a little bit of fun and make something called a squidgy chocolate log. And that's exactly what it is. It's very squidgy and never been known to fail. Everybody absolutely thinks it's yummy. Well, for this, you start off with six eggs and you separate them and you beat the whites up, not quite to the soft peak stage. You want them not too stiff for this. And then the yolks you put into another bowl and you whisk these with five ounces of caster sugar until you get a thickened mixture that's slightly turning pale. But a point to watch is not to overbeat this one because if it starts to get too thick, then it's difficult to fold the egg whites in. The next thing you need is two ounces of cocoa powder. And uh, this is quite funny, this cake, because it doesn't have any flour in it. That's why it's so squidgy. All it has is cocoa powder. And it's got proper cocoa powder in it, not drinking chocolate, because we want, to have, want it to have a nice, dark, sophisticated flavour. So you need to sieve the cocoa powder, because usually it's got a few lumps in it. In fact, we're going to have to press those through a bit with a tablespoon. Then you just whisk the cocoa into the egg mixture. Standing well back, in case you get covered in cocoa. And then just re-incorporate anything that's got stuck around the edge with a spoon because sometimes when you're whisking little bits escape to the edge of the bowl now I'm going to fold the egg whites into that mixture and you start off with one tablespoon of egg white just to slacken it down a bit and we're back to the old folding movements again so you've used one tablespoon of egg white just to slacken the mixture and then the rest can go in and then just use folding movements. When I first saw this recipe, I didn't believe it was possible to actually make something that resembled a cake without any flour. But it certainly is. And everybody loves chocolate cake. Everybody loves chocolatey things. And the trouble with lots of chocolate cakes is they do sometimes tend to be rather stiff and stodgy, so it's lovely to have a really light, melt-in-the-mouth one. There we are. Fold and fold until you've got no more little white bits left. Now, this is going to be transferred to an oblong tin, 11 by 7, and this has been lined, again, with silicone paper, just to make it easier, and if you're lining an oblong tin, the thing to remember, I'll lift the corner out here, is when you've got your oblong of paper, you just make a snip in the corner like that and fold it over, and that makes it fit nice and neatly. And if you've got a bit that refuses to fit, just fold the corner over like that. Now, this goes into this tin. looks very sort of souffle like at the moment and in fact it is a little bit like that you'll have much more time than me to get your bowl absolutely clean just give the tin a little shake like that to even it out this goes in a preheated oven gas mark 4 that's 350 degrees Fahrenheit and it only actually takes 20 minutes to cook and become nice and puffy but we've got one in the oven now so let's just get it out put this one in and have a look Now you'll see that's puffed up quite a lot, exactly like a souffle, but um, I'm afraid, unfortunately, it's not going to stay like that. It's going to suddenly start to shrink down again, back to the size it was before it went in the oven. So when you take it out, you see it is done. Um, 
but it will start to shrink back again. So don't panic and don't worry about it because that's in fact how it's supposed to be. Anyway, I'm now going to show you one that has shrunk back down again. And that's next door over here. And I'm going to show you the next stage. It's turned out onto a sheet of greaseproof paper sprinkled with icing sugar. You can probably see that I've got icing sugar underneath there. And the next thing you do is you spread it with a filling. And this is um, a chocolate mousse filling. Very fattening, this one. It's made with uh, melted chocolate, plain chocolate, and egg yolks and beaten up egg whites. So you spread that over the whole of the cake. And then the next thing that's going to happen is I'm going to add eight fluid ounces of double cream. And just spread that over next. And I'm sure you can now begin to understand <laughs> the word squidgy. Just get a spatula and just prove to you that sometimes I do really scrape my bowls clean. There we are. So, the next thing is that you roll it up. Now, you're probably thinking, when I roll it up, it's going to crack. And you're absolutely right. It probably is going to crack. But that doesn't matter. It still looks very attractive. You just lift up the edge like this with the greaseproof paper, fold it over like that, and then go over again, getting rid of the greaseproof paper as you go. And then you just pack it together with your hands. And you can see it doesn't really matter about the cracks. They look very nice. And you can just sprinkle a little bit more um, icing sugar on the top before you serve it. If it's Christmas, you can stick a sprig of holly in the centre. And, uh, well, I don't know about you, but I think it's nice to be wicked just once in a while. Not too often, perhaps. Well, that's a selection of some of the really delicious things that you can make at home. And don't forget that the recipes are all in my books, which are available at bookshops. And I do hope that sometimes you'll indulge in some home baking, because it's a lovely way to really spoil your family. <laughs>